Good morning. We are going to have uh, another multimedia presentation today. Chalk and voice. Let's write down some terms from last time. What did we, what did we learn about? Well, particularly some materials like uh, photoresist. Silicone, uh, rubber, also known as polydimethyl siloxane or PDMS. We talked about polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, it's poly mixed martial arts. Uh, we talked about block copolymers, so polymers that are tethered together covalently so that they can't separate like oil and water, um, so that they form these cubic or lamellar or hexagonal or gyroidal phases. So block copolymers. We talked about semiconducting polymers for solar cells. What do all of these polymers have in common? They're polymers. It turns out, I, I was only partially joking there. All of these semiconducting polymers are, are polymers. So in order to know the first thing about nanofabrication, we have to know something about, uh, something about polymers, how, they are, uh, how they're made, how they self-assemble in the solid state, and what are their uh, micro and nano structures if you take a microscope and zoom on uh, into them. First, let me try to erase some of this chalk that's impossible to erase. Such violence. I don't think I write that hard. Anyway, okay. Polymers, poly for many, mers for mers. They are named after the monomer. So if we have this molecule, which is called ethylene. And we polymerize it. We take one of these bonds and connect it to another molecule of ethylene. And then we take another one of the double bonds and connect it to the next one. So we lose the double bond in the backbone as we make this structure. And we draw an, we write an N here, so parentheses and an N, and the N means however many repeat units we have going from left to right. And we call this, uh, or we could just write this using the nomenclature of organic chemistry. This is called polyethylene. Polyethylene is a plastic material that we probably have already used today. Um, milk jugs, orange juice jugs, plastic bags, um, lots of things are made from polyethylene. Polyethylene can come in many varieties of low density and high density polyethylene depending on how much, uh, how much mechanical strength and toughness you need higher molecular weight stuff tends to be more uh, tends to be stronger uh, and tougher. How about some other famous uh, polymers? This is called uh, ethylene oxide.
I should say the reason that I that I'm insistent that we name this after the monomer is because you might look at this structure and say that's polyethane, but it's not polyethane. There's no such thing as polyethane. It's named after the named after the monomer, even though ethylene implies that there's a double bond in it. But we take the 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 molecule and we say I'm going to polymerize it and we use use up one of these double bonds in order to make the polymer. So that's where we get the name polyethylene. Ethylene oxide, where this uh, triangle shaped molecule has, this is a CH2 and a CH2 group, we're all okay with that. When we polymerize this we get something that looks like that and this is polyethylene oxide In fact, this unit comes up so often that when it's incorporated in a structure, we call it an uh, ethylene group. Even though there's no double bond like ethylene, the parent structure. Confusing? Yes, but that's the way the polyethylene oxide crumbles. Often this is called PEO in the business. In other businesses like biological sciences and bioengineering, this is called something else. Anyone know what it's called? Horrible P. PEG, polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol is, the, is not the preferred name for this because ethylene glycol is two CH2 units and two OH groups. But that's not what, that's not how you, that's not what you polymerize to get, to get polyethylene oxide. So you'll see this terminology, polyethylene glycol, and they'll mean this, but this is not the preferred nomenclature for uh, nanoengineering, chemistry, chemical engineering. Okay, how about famous polymers in nanofabrication? We talked about polydimethylsiloxane. We have a lot of carbon bonds in the backbone of these materials. How about, can, can we have polymers that have no carbon in the backbone? Yes, we can. Just a silicone rubber, this is polydimethylsiloxane. Or PDMS. Also known as silicone rubber. It's not silicone valley. It's the difference between silicone, which refers to silicone rubber, and silicon or silicon, which refers to the element silicon. Great way to end a dinner conversation with your family. Hear what they're doing at, in Silicon Valley? Okay, last structure I'm going to draw just because it's another famous one. This is called polymethylmethacrylate. PMMA, sometimes this is called acrylic plastic. Sometimes called plexiglass. 
and it is used as a positive e-beam resist or photoresist. That's electron beam or photoresist. You also interact with this material constantly in your day-to-day -day, uh, day -day lives. What is silicone rubber used for? This is used for stamps in soft lithography. There are many ways to characterize a polymer sample. And the typical way that we characterize a molecule is the first thing we want to know about it is its molecular weight. First thing to know about any reactivity of a molecule, how many grams per mole is it? Polymers, however, are not usually monodisperse, which means usually they have some distribution of molecular weights in a given sample. And there are a few ways we might think about how to characterize the molecular weight. We could just take the total weight of, this, of the, uh, the molecules in the sample, or add up all of the, the weights of the molecules in the sample, divide by the number of molecules, and get some, get some number. That would be the, the conventional way to think about it, the, the, um, the conventional average, so to speak. What is just the average weight of the average molecule chosen at random? But that's not necessarily that useful for us, because suppose you have a molecule, you have a, you have a sample comprising two molecules, one with a molecular weight of a million, and one with a molecular weight of one and you get an average and you say that it's 500,000. So 500,000 would be the average molecular weight. Suppose you have another sample consisting of only one polymer chain and it has a molecular weight of a million and its average molecular weight is a million. But wouldn't their physical properties be pretty much the same? You have this big sample with one mo molecule with a molecular weight of a million and its average molecular weight is a million. Then you have this other sample with one molecule that has a molecular weight of a million and one additional molecule with a molecular weight of one. Is that one molecule really going to change anything? The like mechanical properties, like the toughness, the... No, it's, but, but based on the molecular weight that we get, it would be they would have two totally different properties, like one is twice the other. So in order to deal with this, we have the, uh, the weight average molecular weight. So the molecular weight. So picture sample containing two molecules of PEO. Molecule 1 is 1 times 10 to the 6th grams per mole equals 10 to the 6th Daltons. Polymers, in, in the world of polymers and biomolecules, we change grams per mole to Dalton. Don't ask questions. Okay, 10 to the 6th Daltons, or polyethylene oxide, gives you a certain number of repeat units. You take the molecular weight of the polymer and you divide it by the molecular weight of the repeat unit and you get the number of repeat units. And this is 22,700 units.
sometimes called monomer residues. Or just residues. Just residues. So monomer, monomer residue. It's what's left over of the monomer after it's incorporated into the polymer. Okay, so this is the first molecule. The second molecule is one times 44 grams per mole. And this is just a monomer, one repeat unit. Word monomer means one repeat unit. The conventional average is 5 times 10 to the 5 grams per mole. And how do we write this in a more general, sophisticated way? So the conventional number average Mn equals the summation over I of N sub I times M sub I over the summation over I of N sub I. Where N is the number of molecules with degree of polymerization I. And the degree of polymerization I is one for monomer, two for dimer, three for trimer, four for tetramer, and so on. So the degree of polymerization I is the number of residues M is the molecular weight of a polymer chain with degree of polymerization I. Molecular weight of the polymer chain with degree of polymerization I. Okay, so this is the conventional average, but how do we, uh, how do we account for, for the fact that the largest fraction of a polymer's molecular weight could also be made of the largest molecules in the sample. In the case that I talked about a few minutes ago, where you have a, a molecule with a molecular weight of a million and a molecular weight, another one with a molecular weight of one, how do you, how do you account for that? How do you account for the fact that most of the sample is just a big molecular weight polymer? And we do that using the, the weight average And this reflects the uh, weight of the largest fraction of the sample. And the weight average molecular weight is M sub W and it equals the sum over i of w i w sub i times m sub i over the sum over i of w sub i where w sub i is the weight 
of the entire sample with degree of polymerization I. And the molecular weight for our sample over here, the weight average molecular weight, is therefore forty four times forty four plus ten to the sixth times ten to the sixth over forty four plus ten to the sixth. <coughs> and all these forty fours don't really end up mattering very much in the end, so we get about ten to the sixth grams per mole, order of magnitude, which tells us pretty much what we knew to begin with, that the molecular weight of the largest fraction is the more important molecular weight because it's actually reflective of the, um, uh, of the properties that the bulk, uh, that the, that the uh, sample of the polymer will actually have. There's one other concept, which is the polydispersity polydispersity um, you've all heard of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry or IUPAC maybe um, this uh, IUPAC tells you what you what words you can and can't use in anything related to chemistry and chemical engineering and because nanoengineering is so dependent on those, also nanoengineering. Polydispersity refers to the, uh, the way in which a, a polymer sample of different size particles is distributed. You get a polydispersity for uh, quantum dots, too. You could have polydispersity for other kinds of nanoparticles. For, for polymers, uh, polydispersity is defined as, we call it the the PDI, public displays of indifference, or just D with a little line in it, just means dispersity. Actually, IUPAC now says that we don't call it the polydispersity anymore. We just call it the dispersity. Because if you have a polydispersity of, w of one, then, it, then it, and all the sample and all the molecules have the same mass, the same size, that it's not polydisperse at all. It's like saying one people. Which I guess you have in the, probably somewhere in the Constitution, I don't know. Okay, so. Polydispersity is just MW over MN, or the dispersity, if you, same thing. Just MW over MN, and this is, um, uh, MW is always greater than MN, so MW over N MN is always greater than or equal to 1. Something that is exactly 1.00000 means every molecule in the sample has exactly the same molecular weight. Okay, so far so good. Um, there's a practice problem on the homework that was uploaded last night on calculating molecular weight of a somewhat more complicated sample than the one I showed here. Okay, how are these materials made? 
and we won't go into too much detail on the chemistry, but it's really but the chemistry really affects what type of product uh, that you get. So there are two uh, two general types of uh, polymerization. So the two general types we have, let me, let me explain before I draw this. You can imagine having monomers that are produced in two different ways, Monomer, monomer monomers that form a polymer in two different ways. So you can imagine one way where you take a monomer, you add another monomer. Then you take this dimer now, and you add it to another dimer for a tetramer. Then you take the two tetramers, and you add them together for octamers. Or you take an octamer, and you add another dimer, and you get a decamer. Now I'm beyond the point at which I know what the other mers would be. But then you keep taking these structures, and you keep adding up the molecular weights. They just keep multiplying, right? You start out with very small average molecular weight, and by the end of the reaction, you're having like 500 mers add to 500 mers, having 1,000 mers add to 1,000 mers, and anything else you can think of, but the structure, but the average molecular weight only increases a lot at the very end of the reaction. So it's like, it's like having a penny and doubling it every day for a month. And in a month, you'll be a millionaire. But you'll be poor up until the last few days of the doubling, right? So that's, uh, that's how this type of reaction works. And that's called a step growth. But you can also imagine, so what do you need for step growth? You need all of the reactive ends to be reactive with all other reactive ends of every other monomer and polymer in the reaction container, right, in order for this to work. However, what if the monomer and one reactive end of the polymer chain were the only things reactive? Then you would get monomer, equal, monomer plus a monomer equals a dimer, then you add another one, it makes a trimer, then add another one, add another one, add another one, add another one. That's called a chain growth. So you could have step growth or chain growth. Okay, step growth. This is sometimes called a polycondensation. And this is how a poly uh, amino acid or poly polypeptide or uh, polypeptide would be made except in biological systems, because they're made by enzymes, which screw up my whole argument here. But bear with me for now. Say you had a monomer that was reactive on both ends, like this, and you subjected it to, uh, to, uh, to heat, and you, and you drove the reaction all the way to the right. You end up with this times n plus some number of water molecules because we lost the oxygen atom here and the hydrogen atom here and we lost one of the hydrogen atoms here. So we condense this to make this polymer plus some number of, hydro of water molecules. And what you do when you do this reaction is you would put this under high heat and vacuum and suck out the water as it's produced because by Le Chatelier's principle at all, you want it to shift to the right, right? Okay, how about a chain growth? So this is just in a flask. Um, in a biological system, if you wanted to make a, a polypeptide, there's actually an enzyme that controls the addition of one amino acid 
after another. So in a biological system, a polypeptide is actu actually follows chain growth kinetics, not step growth kinetics. So what's an example of uh, chain growth? This would be radical or an ionic mechanism. And it's the way things like polystyrene are made. So this is called styrene. And if you polymerize this, you get something called polystyrene. In general, if you see a polymer structure that's a bunch of CH2 units in the back, a bunch of zigzag of carbon atoms in the back, it's usually grown by chain growth kinetics. So you could have something like this. And this is called, this is the, the giveaway for chain growth. The giveaway structure for chain growth. And this is called a polyolefin, where the word olefin is an ancient, ancient word meaning double bond, which sounds like an elf and an orc's child. This could be a, ha a halide. The X, you mean? Yeah. So the X could be a lot of different things. If the X is a, um, this won't be on the test, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it. So the, if the X is, is this, you have polystyrene. If it's chloride, then you have polyvinyl chloride. If it's CH, Three, you have polypropylene, um, like carpet is always almost always polypropylene unless it's like wool or something. Um, polypropylene is also the top of a Tic Tac box, among many many uh, other other applications. The body of a Tic Tac box is polystyrene. Um, polyvinyl chloride, like uh, pipes, things that are that are called vinyl usually polyvinyl chloride, even though vinyl means a lot of different things, but usually they mean polyvinyl chloride. Um, yeah, there are a lot of different polyolefins that depend on what the, the identity of the X uh, group is. Okay, now chain growth can be subdivided even further into two types. Uncontrolled and the opposite of uncontrolled is controlled. What do I mean by uncontrolled and controlled? Well, let's imagine that we are growing a chain from, from starting with a monomer and we're growing the chain out. You could imagine that you have a, a flask or a, or a reaction vat at a, at a, at a f factory where the polymer chains grow at, at uh, different times and, at, and they, they grow and they stop whenever they, whenever they want. So the uh, chain is polymerized here, 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 here. So you have something that goes from a molecular weight of one to a molecular weight of a million. It wouldn't really be one, but like one monomer to a degree of polymerization of like a million monomers 
in some fraction of a second. And it just goes until it crashes into some other reactive species or the, the, end of the, the reactive end of the molecule is quenched somehow or it joins up with another reactive end of a molecule. And then the same thing happens over here and over here and over here at different times. Now the product that you get from this reaction is not very controllable, right? Because you don't know when it's going to terminate. There's going to be some statistical distribution. And also you don't have control. What if you wanted to change the monomer in sequence and make a block copolymer? Like you wanted to bring all the polymer chains up to a certain molecular weight, then add in some other reactive molecule to make a block copolymer. So two different polymers that were linked in the center. You couldn't do that this way in an uncontrolled reaction. So this is kind of like, uh, kind of like how popcorn is made. The popcorn model. Because it goes pop, 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 and so on. And you can imagine, what if you slowed them all down? What if you slowed them down a lot and you had some capping agent, some molecule that would sort of block the end of the molecule from growing. And it would come off every so often to let a new monomer in. If you capped all the growing chains, so instead of pop, popping, pop, 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 it, it, it went like, and then immediately it was capped by some molecule. And the molecule comes off and a new monomer comes in, comes off a new monomer comes in, and so on. Then you have all the molecules growing at the same time. And once the, mono once the monomers are all used up in the flask or in the reaction container or in the, in the, the reactor, then maybe you add in another polymer, uh, or you add in another monomer, and then it starts growing again. Then you use them all up, then you add in another one, and you can, you can, you can make it uh, whatever complex molecular structure you want. Also, when you do it this way, you get a very low polydispersity because since they're all growing at the same time, then they, uh, and you're only adding like one or two monomers at a time as this capping group comes on and off the growing, the growing chain end, you can make uh, a, a system that has, where all the, where, that has a very narrow distribution of molecular weights. Does that make sense? So this I would call like the grass growing grass model. I didn't Google this before to see if I was the first one to come up with this analogy, but I think popcorn and, and grass is, is really my, my thing, so you're welcome. So in uncontrolled, all chains start and stop growing at different times. And you have a high dispersity. In the controlled mechanism, we use a capping agent. So all chains grow at the same time. And this gives us a low dispersity and, um, and allows for block copolymers. So we all, remember, we all remember what a block copolymer is from the last lecture. You have all monomers A, 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 B, or then, and then you have a, another block that's B, 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 which you usually don't want to mix, but because they're covalently linked in the center, they can't avoid mixing, so they make those structures like the cubic structure, the hexagonal structure, the lamellar structure, and the gyroid structure. Okay, you can only make those 
using these uh, uh, controlled types of polymerizations. Now, these two uh, step growth and uncontrolled chain growth follow a different kinetic pattern from the controlled chain growth. So what if we were to plot the conventional average uh, molecular weight from 0 to 100 as a function of the percent conversion of end groups? So the percent, percent reaction, basically. The controlled radical polymerization looks like this. I'm not going to say radical because I didn't say radical over here, but it could be radical or ionic. Don't worry about the chemistry there. Just know that there are ways to do this. So this is a controlled, uh, a controlled chain growth. Polymerization. When I was first describing step growth, we talked about the pennies and doubling them every month, every day for a month. In a month, you'd be a millionaire. That kind of looks like this. So at the beginning, we have only dimers and trimers and tetramers and octamers and 50 emers and maybe 100 mers and 1,000 mers and 10,000 mers, and now all of a sudden we've got a million mers. And this is characteristic of a step growth mechanism and also uncontrolled chain growth. And whether we decide to do one or the other depends on the cost of doing the manufacturing or the synthesis. It depends on what properties we want to get out of it. Most um, polymers that we see every day are made, um, are, are not actually made using controlled, um, uh, controlled processes. They are when we, uh, when they're like engineering plastics that need to have very well-defined uh, properties, but a milk jug, for example, would not be made by controlled radical polymerization. It would be made just by the uncontrolled popcorn mechanism. Okay, let's talk about the structure of molecules and their sizes in solution and in the solid state. And this is where we get, um, we get into into nano. I have five minutes left. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna draw a structure and then I'm gonna take, uh, take questions because I know I went through a lot today. This is a the freely jointed chain model. So you have a center of mass of a polymer. When you put a polymer in solution, it doesn't look like this, like we've kind of implied, because that would be a very low entropy state, right? It's flopping around all over the place because it wants to maximize its entropy. To maximize its entropy, it balls up like that. And it has some characteristic 
dimension, Rg called the radius of gyration. And the radius of gyration is the is the root mean squared distance of a monomer from the center of mass of the polymer blob. the monomer residue. From the center of mass. And for a freely jointed chain, freely jointed chain doesn't assume any molecules or steric forces or anything. Any bond can bend in any direction. Almost like, um, almost like a, a string. You know those old style jump ropes? Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't. But these old style jump ropes that they used to have in like elementary school gyms that had little plastic pieces in between. That's a freely jointed chain because it can bend in any direction, um, and it's and it can even bend back over on itself in 180 degrees, and so on. So uh, mathematically, we can show. Um, we're not going to show it, but that the radius of gyration is equal to L times the square root of the degree of polymerization. This is not the square root of the imaginary uh, square root of negative one. This is the square root of the degree of polymerization over, uh, over square root of six. And for L equals, L is the length of the monomer. And let's say that it's about one nanometer, and say that the, the, the degree of polymerization is, say, 10 to the 4 Daltons, then we have a radius of gyration of 40 nanometers. And that would be typical of a blob, of a polymer blob in solution using this model. Now, is this always a good model, freely jointed chain model? Definitely not. Definitely, it's not always a good model um, because you have atoms that stick out of these you have hydrogen atoms that stick out of the carbon atoms and it restricts rotation in certain ways. So you'll need to be able to program that into your, your model somehow, but this is sort of the simplest way to think about it. Um, we will continue talking about um, sizes of molecules and microstructures and then um, we'll probably finish up polymers somewhere around Wednesday and um, that, will be, uh, that will be it for polymers. And we'll talk about um, bio uh, applications and size confinement effects. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good weekend.